Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Regulation of ALC1 by TRIM33 During the DNA Damage Response. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar, as a part of the Cell Culture Heroes series, is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by GIBCO by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about the Cell Culture Heroes webinar series or stay connected on the latest events sponsored by GIBCO, please visit the Resources tab. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Rukia Henry, PhD candidate, Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Rukia, you may now begin your presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction. I am really excited to be the Give Coastal Culture Hero for the month of June, and I am excited to present today's presentation that is entitled The Regulation of ALK-1 by TRIM33 During the DNA Damage Response. And for the introduction, I'm Rukia Henry once more, and I'm a PhD candidate at Rutgers University, and I work under the supervision of Dr. Sridhar Ganesan at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. So before I go into today's presentation, I would just like to take a minute to tell you all a little about me. And so I was actually born in Guyana. And I come from a small town called Linden, known as the mining town of Linden, where I grew up. And I have lived here until I was 17 years old. And so I attended primary and secondary school, or high school as it's known in Guyana. And a fun fact, Guyana is the only English-speaking country in South America. And as you can see, it is actually near Venezuela and Brazil, just for some context. Guyana is also a part of the Caribbean, so I'm not only South American, I'm also Caribbean as well. Now, while I was living in Guyana, I always knew that I wanted to pursue higher education. And so I was determined to be able to come to the U.S. where I would be able to obtain that. And so in 2014, I attended Howard University where I pursued my Bachelor's of Science degree in biology. And while at Howard University, I was involved in different undergraduate research projects. Um, one of my research focus while at Howard looked at mapping the anatomical locations of HIV replication in the pediatric brain. Furthermore, one summer I interned at Princeton University and I studied the pathogenesis of herpes viral infection in the central nervous system. So most of my undergraduate research experience has been in neurovirology. And so how did a neurovirologist in training end up doing cancer research? So unfortunately, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And as I, on my own, was doing literature review to see different treatments that were available for her metastatic diagnosis, I realized that the field of cancer research was ever still evolving and that there was still room for new and better innovative treatments, specifically targeted treatments. And so with that in mind, I decided to attend graduate school where I can be able to conduct cancer research on my own. And so I applied and I accepted the invitation to attend Rutgers University primarily because this would have given me the opportunity to conduct research at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And this was a great opportunity as 
I was able to join the lab of Dr. Sridhar Ganesan at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and he is the Associate Director for Translational Science. And I also work under the close supervision of Dr. Atul Kolkrani, who is a research teaching specialist. And so the Ganesan lab predominantly studies DNA repair defects in cancer, and it's primarily interested in looking at if these defects can be exploited to develop novel, effective, and innovative treatment for breast cancer. And so today's presentation will show you a project that looked at the DNA damage response and also proteins involved in DNA repair. And this project was spearheaded by Dr. Atul Kulkrini under whose supervision in the lab I work with. And so for the learning objective of today's presentation, I am interested in helping everyone understand the mechanisms of DNA damage and repair, how the PARP-dependent DNA damage response pathway is regulated, and finally, understanding how key proteins involved in the DNA damage response, including TRIM33 and ALK1, can serve as actionable targets in the treatment of certain cancers. And so, how does our DNA become damaged? And when it does, how does our cells repair this damaged DNA? And so we can have single-stranded DNA damage, or we can have double-stranded DNA damage. And depending on which of these occurs, our cells employ varying mechanisms that would repair that damage. And so for single-stranded DNA damage, these can include repairs such as base excision repair, if there is a single damaged nucleotide, we also have nucleotide excision repair, and this is involved in removing bulky addicts from our DNA. Furthermore, while our cells are undergoing DNA replication, there can be errors where our bases can become mismatched. And so our cells would therefore need to employ mismatch repair in order to excise and synthesize the correct DNA strand and repair it. Furthermore, with double-stranded DNA breaks, our cells usually employ two pathways, the non-homologous end joining pathway and the homologous recombination repair. And with all of these different forms of repair that our cells employ, there are particularly important proteins that can help to facilitate this effective repair of our DNA. And so today, I will be trying to explain to you some of the main proteins that can regulate the DNA damage response in our cells. One of the main important proteins that we study in the Ganesan, in the Ganesan lab is the poly-ADP ribose polymerase or PARP protein, and this is an important DNA repair factor that is involved in the DNA damage response. And so, in our normal cells, PARP is usually at our chromatin. Now, with the induction of DNA damage, what we have is that PARP1 becomes activated, and the activation of PARP1 at sites of DNA breaks causes the formation of what is known as PAR chains. And so these poly-ADP ribose chains essentially serve as a scaffold to recruit other important proteins involved in the DNA damage response, such as we can see here, APLF and ALK1. And so think about PARP as the important protein that is able to recruit all of the other different proteins that are responsible for DNA repair. So if you have, per se, a building under construction, you would usually see scaffolds being built that will allow multiple workers to work on that building at once. So PARP and PARP function in that same way. And so one of the main projects in the Ganesan lab 
looked at the tripartite motif containing 33 or trim 33 and we found that this protein functions in the poly ADP ribose polymerase or PARP dependent DNA damage response through the interaction with amplified in liver cancer one protein. And so today's presentation will be following this work that was spearheaded by Dr. Atul Kulkarni that I introduced earlier. And so what is trim 33 and ALK1 before we progress? And so the tripartite motif containing 33 or trim 33 is a nuclear protein involved in chromatin regulation and signaling. It contains a ring domain, two B boxes, and a plant homeo domain, a bromo domain at the C terminus as well that we see here. Now, trim 33 acts as an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and it promotes MAD4 ubiquitination, nuclear exclusion, and degradation via the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. It interacts with ALK1 which is a chromatin remodeler and remove it from sites of DNA damage after DNA repair has been initiated. And today's presentation will show you how we were able to delineate this conclusion. Now, ALK1 specifically is a chromodomain helicase DNA binding protein one-like that is known as the amplified in liver cancer one. And it is a member of the S and F2 superfamily of ATPases that carry a macro domain that binds to the poly ADP ribose or the PAR chains at sites of DNA damage. And ALK1 functions as a chromatin remodeling enzyme that is able to relax the chromatin so that other important repair factors can come in at the sites of DNA damage and initiate DNA repair. And so what we knew was that previous studies have shown that ALK1 is rapidly recruited to sites of DNA damage via its macro domain dependent binding with PAR. And the retention of ALK1 on damaged chromatin is extremely short-lived. And so this rapid association and dissociation of ALK1 from damaged sites what implies to us that its chromatin association is strictly controlled and regulated. And so in order to gain insight into the regulation of ALK1 during DNA damage response, our lab sought to identify proteins that might interact with ALK1 upon DNA damage. And so what we see here is the result from an experiment where HEC293 control cells and HEC293 cells expressing a flag tagged wild type ALK1 were either mock treated or treated with bleomycin and subjected to immunoprecipitation using flag B. And the immunoprecipitates were then analyzed by liquid chromatography mass spec analysis to identify potential interacting proteins with ALK1. And so what was observed was that in agreement with previous reports, peptides for PARP1, APLF, H2B, the Q proteins Q70 and Q80, and DNA PKs, which are known to be involved in DNA repair, were thought to, to be associating with ALK1. Now, what was interesting was that peptides for TRIM33 were also found in these ALK1 immunoprecipitates. However, what is important to note was that this was only observed in the bleomycin-treated samples. And this observation raised the possibility that TRIM33 potentially interacts with ALK1. And so, to confirm these findings, HeLa cells were then mock treated or treated with 300 micromolars of bleomycin for one hour and then subjected to immunoprecipitation using antibody against the endogenous expression of TRIM33. And what we see to the right is the result of the Western blot analysis that shows, in fact, ALK1 is found in the TRIM33 immunoprecipitate 
only after induction of DNA damage with bleomycin and hydro and hydroxyurea, indicating that TRIM33 and ALK1 indeed interact in a DNA-dependent manner. And so, furthermore, we were now interested in examining the localization of TRIM33 to site of DNA breaks in vitro. And so before I go ahead and show the results from other experiments that use immunofluorescence, I wanted to explain one of the important experimental procedures that we employ in the Ganesan lab that helps us to study DNA damage and visualize the damage after. And so on day one, what we would do is we would plate our cancer cells in a chamber slide. We would leave them to grow overnight. And then on day two, we would transfect them with our plasmid of interest. And so if we would like to identify or observe the dynamics of TRIM33, we can transfect with a TRIM33 plasmid that also contains a GFB construct. And on this same day, we will also treat ourselves with iodo deoxyurea that will also help to sensitize our cells to DNA damage. Now, on day three, what we do is we induce DNA damage using UV laser scissors. And unlike continuing exposure to agents such as bleomycin that can induce ongoing DNA damage, Laser scissors induce an acute transient DNA damage at very defined time points, making it really amendable to high resolution time course analysis. And so once we have induced that damage, if we're looking at varying time points to see the recruitment or dynamics of proteins involved in DNA damage, we will fix those cells and then we will stain with phospho H2AX antibodies. And gamma H2AX is a common marker that is used in DNA damage because it indicates to us that DNA damage has indeed occurred. Then once we have done that, we can visualize under a fluorescence microscope to observe our protein of interest. And so I also would like to explain some of the TRIM33 mutant constructs that we might use to transfect our cells with. And so this shows a wild type schematic of TRIM33, including all of its functional domains, including the ring domain, the B-boxes domain, and also the PhD and bromo domain. Furthermore, we also have mutants with a ring domain mutant, TRIM33CA, labeled here. We also have this ring domain with two cysteine to alanine mutants at amino acids 125 and 128 deleted. Furthermore, we have another TRIM33 mutant with the internal deletion of the histone binding PhD domain or the bromo domain as well. Furthermore, there is the mutant form of TRIM33 with the ATPase domain mutated as seen here. And so in order for us to examine the localization of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks, we treated our HeLa cells with IDU and then we subjected them to UV laser scissors. And what we can see on the right is the results showing that about five minutes post DNA damage with the UV laser scissors, we see the dynamic recruitment of TRIM33 at these break sites. It is sustained and observed about 10 to 15 minutes, but then at 30 minutes, we no longer see TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks. And so, to determine which domains of TRIM33 may contribute to its localization to these sites of DNA breaks, we treated HeLa cells with the flag tag constructs encoding either the wild type TRIM33 
are the series of mutant constructs, including the ring domain mutants, TRIM 33 CA, the TRIM 33 PHD domain mutants, and the TRIM 33 Bromo domain mutants, as well as the ACPA Z mutants. What we observed was that the TRIM 33 CA mutants in previous reports has been shown to lack ubiquitin ligase activity. And previous reports have also indicated that the TRIM 33 PHD AAA mutant has been shown to not bind methylated histone residues. And so we subjected these HeLa cells to UV laser damage and TRIM 33 localization was monitored by immunofluorescence. And what we can see is that wild type TRIM33 and the TRIM33CA mutant both localized rapidly to sites of DNA break. In contrast, the deletion of either the PHD domain or the BROMO domain abrogated TRIM33's localization to the site of these laser damage. The TRIM33 PHD with the ATPase mutant form also greatly reduced the localization at DNA break, as we can see here. And so what this told us was that the chromatin binding PHD and bromo domains are critical for the robust localization of TRIM33 to sites of DNA breaks. Furthermore, to investigate the potential role of TRIM33 in the DNA damage response, our lab examined the effect of depleting TRIM33 on the sensitivity of cells to DNA damaging agents. And so HeLa cells were transfected with either an SH or SI RNA with two different TRIM33 SH RNA or one TRIM33 SI RNA. And after 48 hours, the cells were treated with different concentrations of bleomycin, which is a DNA damaging agent. And the introduction, and so we observed the dynamics of cell survival with the introduction of these shRNA. And what we can see is that with the control shRNA, that the cells were still able to survive with increasing concentrations of bleomycin treatment. However, those cells that were treated with the TRIM33 mutants showed increased sensitivity to the bleomycin treatment. Furthermore, in this panel, what we can see is that the introduction of an shRNA resistant wild type TRIM33 could rescue that bleomycin sensitivity of TRIM33 depletion. And this can be seen here. If we look at the blue line, this is showing our control shRNA. Our pink line is just cells treated with the TRIM33 shRNA only. With the introduction of the TRIM33 wild type vector, this was able to rescue the cell survival and desensitize it to the bleomycin treatment, indicating to us that TRIM33 plays a role in the DNA damage response. Further, we wanted to investigate which DNA repair protein was involved in recruiting TRIM to sites of DNA breaks and was regulating its localization at these sites. And so in these set of experiments, TRIM33 localization to sites of DNA breaks was evaluated with inhibiting three important DNA repair proteins, including ATM, ATR, and DNAPK. And in these set of experiments, this showed us that when we treated cells with an ATM inhibitor, we could still see the recruitment of TRIM33 at the site of DNA breaks. When an ACR mutant was introduced in these cells, we were still able to see the recruitment and localization of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks. Furthermore, DNA PK deficient cells 
labeled M059J was unaffected and we can still see the recruitment of TRIM33 at the site of DNA breaks. So this told us that TRIM33 is not dependent on ATM, ATR, or DNA PK. Now, given that TAR formation is required for the recruitment of some DNA repair proteins, including ALK1 that was shown earlier, our lab wanted to examine the role of TAR in the recruitment of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks. And so what we see in this panel is that when our cells were treated with a PARP inhibitor, we first could not see any formation of PAR compared to the control. Further, in looking at the localization of TRIM33 to sites of DNA breaks in these cells that are treated with the PARP inhibitor, we could not see the localization and recruitment of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks. And we know that DNA damage occurred because we could visualize phosphor H2AX. And so this set of experiments helped to tell us that TRIM33 is localized to sites of DNA breaks in a PARP-dependent manner. Furthermore, the recruitment of TRIM33 to UV laser scissors induced damage was also greatly reduced in PARP-deficient mouse embryonic fibroblasts when compared with PARP wild-type mouse embryonic fibroblasts, as we can see here. And so furthermore, we know that the DNA repair proteins APLF and ALK1 are recruited to sites of DNA damage in a PARP-dependent manner. And so we, our lab was interested in investigating which regions of ALK1 may be required for TRIM33 localization to DNA breaks if indeed they may interact. And so, Cells stably expressing an ALK1 SH or short hairpin was reconstituted with a wild type ALK1. We also treated cells with an ALK1 K77R mutant, which is the ATPase dead form of ALK1. We also treated these cells with an ALK1 D723A macro domain mutant, which is unable to interact with PAR and fails to localize the DNA breaks. We then subjected these cells to UV laser-induced breaks, and TRIM33 localization was observed using immunofluorescence against, bodies, against antibodies of TRIM33. And so in this first panel, we can see that with the control SHRNA, we are able to visualize TRIM33. In those cells that are treated with an ALK1 SH, there is reduced accumulation of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks. Now, when the cells were reconstituted with a well-type ALK1, this was able to rescue the activity and localization of TRIM33 at sites of DNA breaks, as we can see here. In the kinase dead or the ATPase dead mutant form of ALK1 treated cells we were still able to see TRIM33 recruited to the site of DNA breaks. However, when the PAR binding mutant form of ALK1 was treated, we could not see the recruitment or localization of TRIM33 at the site of DNA breaks. And what this told us was that the PAR binding activity of ALK1 but not its catalytic activity is required for its function in localizing TRIM33 to the site of DNA breaks. And so furthermore, we wanted to determine whether the DNA damage induced interaction of ALK1 and TRIM33 is dependent on PAR synthesis. And so, we were 
what our lab did was perform co-immunoprecipitation experiments in DNA-treated nuclear extracts of HeLa cells. And so these HeLa cells were either mock treated or treated with a PARP inhibitor and then exposed to zero gray, 10 grays of ionizing radiation or 100 joules of UV light. These treatments were specifically chosen because our lab recognized that they would allow us to follow the dynamics of interaction after an acute episode of DNA damage. Now, although the interaction of ALK1 and TRIM33 was not detected in untreated cells, what was observed was a robust interaction five minutes after both ionizing radiation and UV light treatment with TRIM33 and ALK1. And this was partially diminished after 10 minutes, as we can see for both ionizing radiation and the UV light treatment. Furthermore, the interaction of TRIM33 and ALK1 after ionizing radiation and UV light treatment was significantly reduced in cells that were treated with a PARP inhibitor, as we can see on the right panel side here. And so this suggested to us that TRIM33 and ALK1 interact in response to DNA damage and that it is partly dependent on active PAR synthesis at these sites of DNA damage. To determine now whether the PAR binding activity of ALK1 or its ATPase activity is required for its interaction with TRIM33, cells were transfected with a flag tag construct encoding either WOW type ALK1, the ATPase dead mutant form of ALK1 labeled K77R, or the macro domain mutant labeled D723A, and this one cannot bind to PAR. And the cells were subjected to UV damage. The cell extracts were collected after five minutes post DNA damage and immunoprecipitated with anti flag B and processed for Western blot analysis, which we see here. And they were processed against antibodies for TRIM33. And what we observed was that both the wild type ALK1 and ALK1 K77R mutants interacted with TRIM33 after UV damage. However, what was observed was that the macro domain mutant D723A, which does not localize the DNA break, failed to interact with TRIM33. And so further, to determine now whether the PAR binding of ALK1 is sufficient enough to in interact with TRIM33, a PAR bound ALK1 immobilized on nitrocellulose was incubated with purified TRIM33. And after washing, it was analyzed with immunoblotting with antibodies to TRIM33. What was observed was that there was no interaction of par bound ALK1 with TRIM33 using this approach. And so these experiments suggested to our lab that the par binding of ALK1 is not by itself sufficient to induce the interaction of ALK1 with TRIM33 in vitro. Next. Our lab was interested in investigating the effects of TRIM33 on the dynamics of ALK1 recruitment to sites of DNA damage. And so, our lab depleted TRIM33 by shRNA in HeLa cells. And then these cells were treated with an shRNA, and we noticed that ALK1 was rapidly recruited to sites of laser scissors induced damage, but it was not detectable at these sites 45 minutes post damage. In contrast, what was observed was that treatment of cells with the TRIM33 shRNA resulted in prolonged retention of ALK1 
at the site of laser scissors damage, and ALK-1 could even be seen 45 minutes after treatment. And this was consistent with prior reports that had indicated that ALK-1 is also accompanied by the prolonged retention of XRCC1, which is another important DNA repair protein at site of DNA damage. So, to examine the impact of TRIM-33 on ALK-1 recruitment at site of DNA damage, our lab complemented TRIM-33 knockdown cells with an SHRNA resistant wild type TRIM-33 and the ring domain mutant TRIM-33CA. Importantly to note was that the prolonged retention of ALK-1 at damage sites observed in the TRIM-33 knockdown cells, as we saw in the first set of experiments, was corrected by the introduction of the SHRNA resistance while type TRIM-33 construct. However, this was not corrected by the TRIM-33CA ring domain mutant. And so what this told us was that TRIM-33 is required for the timely dissociation of ALK-1 from the site of DNA damage and that this function requires an intact ring domain. Furthermore, we wanted to see or, and determine whether ALK1 overexpression leads to similar effects. Furthermore, in investigating the dynamics of ALK1's recruitment and association at DNA breaks in relation to TRIM-33, what we observed was that TRIM-33 knockdown has no effect on the dynamics of PAR at the UV laser-induced DNA break. And in these set of experiments, in both control and TRIM-33 knockdown cells, PAR rapidly localized the DNA break at five minutes, but it was not present at these breaks post 45 minutes, suggesting to us that in the absence of TRIM-33, ALK-1 remains at these breaks, even when PAR is no longer present. And so collectively, these experiments suggested that TRIM-33 is required for the timely dissociation of ALK-1 from the site of DNA, and that this function requires also an intact ring domain from the previous experiment I showed. Furthermore, we know now that ALK1 dissociation is delayed in TRIM-33 depleted cells. And so now our lab wanted to determine whether the overexpression of ALK1 would lead to a similar effect. And so they evaluated the dynamic of ALK1 overexpression on its localization to UV laser scissors in juice breaks. Now cells overexpressing wild type ALK1, labeled FLP in ALK1 here, showed the prolonged retention of ALK1 at site of DNA breaks. Now the overexpression of wild type TRIM-33 was able to restore this ALK1 dynamic, and ALK1 can no longer be detected at sites of DNA breaks after 45 minutes with the introduction of wild type TRIM. And so the overexpression of wild type TRIM was able to restore ALK1's dynamics, suggesting that the proper stoichiometry between TRIM-33 and ALK1 is indeed essential for the timely dissociation of ALK1 from sites of DNA breaks. Now, ALK1 has been shown and is known to be amplified and overexpressed in certain cancers, suggesting that it can be functioning as an oncogene. And so our data raised the possibility that relative levels of ALK1 and TRIM-33 may be important for the regulation of ALK1's activity.
And so to directly investigate the effect of TRIM33 expression on the phenotype associated with alkaline overexpression, cells that were stably overexpressing either an empty vector labeled FLP FLP in SWAG or wild type ALK1 were analyzed for sensitivity to bleomycin. And shown here is the result of the experiment showing that the overexpression of wild type TRIM33 greatly reduces the sensitivity of ALK1 overexpression of cells to bleomycin with these cells showing similar sensitivity as the vector expressing cells. However, the overexpression of the ring domain mutant, TRIM33CA, failed to rescue the bleomycin sensitivity of ALK1 overexpressing cells. And so the effects of TRIM33 overexpression on the induction of DNA breaks it's consistent with reports that suggest ALK1 overexpression promotes chromatin relaxation, and with it still being there, the increased overexpression increases the accessibility of the DNA damaging agent, bleomycin. The overexpression of the wild type TRIM33, but not the TRIM33CA mutants, was able to counteract the effect of this ALK1 overexpression after the induction of DNA damage. And so cells that were overexpressing trimmed ALK1 were able to then be reduced in expression after the introduction of wild type TRIM33. And this is consistent with prior results shown previously in the presentation indicating that elevated TRIM33 expression can counteract the phenotype of ALK1 overexpression and that this requires an intact ring domain because the ring, the ring mutant domain is not able to rescue this expression. And so together, these experiments help to create this model for the interaction of TRIM33 and ALK1 in DNA repair. And so we know that with the induction of DNA damage, we have the activation of PARP that is at the sites of DNA breaks. With the formation of PAR chains or PAR synthesis, the recruitment of important proteins like ALK1 comes in and relaxes the chromatin. Now TRIM33 comes in and presumably performs its function as a ubiquitin ligase and ubiquitinates ALK1 possibly, removing it from the site of DNA breaks. And as we have shown in these experiments, TRIM33 knockdown confers DNA damage sensitivity in cells and it delays the association of ALK1. And given that these proteins are interacting and are a part of the DNA damage response, they can also serve as targeted proteins for treatment in different types of cancers where they are overexpressed. And so I would like to now thank my lab members and my lab supervisor, Dr. Sridhar Ganesan, for all of his help in helping to train me with these different techniques and to perform experiments similar to this that was discussed today. Also, this project was spearheaded by Atul Kulkarni, who I work under direct supervision with in the lab as well, and also our other lab members who are all instrumental in helping to perform these experiments. And at this time, I will take any questions from the audience. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Rukia, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, 
Do you know if TRIM33 is implicated in any kind of health diseases and what type of cancer? Yes. So from previous studies, we do know that the loss of TRIM33 cooperates with KRAS activation, and this induces a lot of cystic tumors and adenocarcinomas of the pancreas. And also, TRIM33 has been implicated in a lot of blood cancers, such as B-cell and acute pro myelocytic leukemia, also BL and CMML. And so we do know that TRIM33 has been implicated in these specific types of cancers. Um, there has been data showing that it's also implicated in certain thyroid cancers where it forms fusions with other proteins that drive the progression of that cancer. So yes, those are a few of the diseases that it's implicated in. Thank you, Rufia. Our next question here is, are there any drugs on the market that potentially target TRIM33? On the market right now, I know that there is currently a clinical trial looking at bromo domain inhibitors to see if that is effective. As in the presentation, I noted that TRIM33 has a bromo domain, and so hopefully through this clinical trial, it's successful and we can then start treating patients that might have the trim proteins implicated in their cancers with this bromo domain inhibitor, hopefully. Thank you again, Rukia. We have one more question here. Do we know exactly how trim 33 removes ALC1 from sites of DNA breaks and during repair? Well, what we do know is that TRIM33 is an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and so it marks proteins for degradation. And currently in the lab, Dr. Tool Kulkarni is investigating this, so hopefully this data will be published soon and we'll be able to know the mechanism of that. Thank you again, Rukia, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Gibco by Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.